Welcome to the study of God's Word recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now let's open our Bibles and study God's Word. Amen, amen. Well, if you'd like to title your message, I did title today's message, Unexpected Grace. And so let's dive in right away. Acts chapter 3 here. I'm going to read out the first, uh, I don't know, we'll go handful, maybe we'll even go a little bit more than a handful of verses here. Here's here's what it says, uh, that Peter and John, they went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. Now, as they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. And each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one that they called Beautiful Gate. And so he could beg from the people going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John, they they looked at him intently, and, and, and Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting to receive some money. But Peter said, I, I don't have any silver or gold for you. But I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And then Peter took the lame man by the the right hand and he helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and his ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. Now he jumped up, he stood on his feet and he began to walk. And then walking, leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. And all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. And when they realized that this was the lame beggar that they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. And they rushed out in in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. And this is an act of unexpected grace. And what we're going to look at and what we're going to see here tonight, we're, we're, going to, we're going to have a Bible study where we're going to observe what is taking place. And I'll, give a, a, give a, you know, I'll point out a few portions of observation that we should take note of. And then we're going to dive very heavy into some application. Because, gang, we are living in a time and we're living through a time where stress in our individual and our daily lives is at such an all-time high. And, man, we need to be encouraged with God's Word. We need to be able to have hope in God to experience that unexpected grace. And I hope that you're ready. I hope you grab hold of your seat and you're ready. Why? Because look to your neighbor and say, Jesus is alive. Do you believe that? All right, do you also believe that Jesus is coming back? Amen and amen. That's, that's the great hope. That's why we're still here. That's why, that, that, that's why we dive in week by week to Bible studies. Well, our very first big idea here, idea number one is this, is the miracle. And so, again, here's a few observations to, to, to just take note of as we're looking at this. First thing is this. Let us remember the scene that we're looking at. We're in Acts chapter 3. What's before Acts chapter 3? This ain't hard. You can do this. What's, what's before Acts chapter 3? Acts chapter 2. That's the birth of the church, right? So the birth of the church. And, 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 and what's the tone? What's the climate up in Jerusalem at this point in time? Well, Acts chapter 3, some, some commentators, some scholars, they say that, hey, this may have been a couple weeks, maybe as long as a couple months later that you get into Acts chapter 3 and all that stuff. But the tone and the climate that was up in Jerusalem at that point was that God moved and people saw that. And there was an excitement that was there. There was an expectancy there. And man, I want to see God work in his church again. He's moving in our hearts. He's moving in our pews. He's moving in our churches. And there's an excitement Because we can just taste and we can just see that on the global scene that God's about to come back, that he's about to send Jesus back. And whether that happens in my lifetime, your lifetime, or not, one thing's for certain is we will all meet our maker at some point in time. And I want to be ready to meet Jesus. I don't want to be ashamed at his appearing, at his coming. I want to stand confidently in what he's given. I want to have that close relationship with him. And in Acts chapter 2, again, that expectancy that was there, there was a hunger that was there for something else. They, they want Jesus. Now, the second thing, you know, again, we're just looking at this scene of Acts chapter 3. The second thing to take note of is this. Now, remember the practice of that day, okay? So this is, this is before we had mega churches and before we had church buildings and all that stuff. You know, uh, again, we're looking at, uh, you know, a few weeks, maybe even a few months in, in the sense of how new the church was. And so what did they do? The early Christians were using the structure and the resources of Judaism at that time. 
and, 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 you know, whether they were gathering for worship or gathering for, for prayer or anything like that, up on the Temple Mount, verse number one, this is where Peter and, and John were going, and, and up on the Temple Mount, there was all of the outer courts there, if you will. And the early church took advantage of those things to, to meet and to gather. But the one thing is for certain, and one thing that we get away from sometimes is we, maybe we walk a little farther with Jesus, that, that we, we neglect that first excitement when we first got saved. I don't know what your salvation story is, but I have a very radical salvation story. May 7th of 1993, at 8 o'clock at night, 21-year-old young man, been married for a year, and he was going in the ditch. And I was getting involved in law enforcement as a, as a, as a young man. But one night, everything came unhinged, and I didn't have a relationship with God. You know, as I shared with you earlier, you know, from dad's side, it was Catholicism. From mom's side, it was Pentecostalism. It left me confused. But that night, with my wife and my one-year-old daughter in the other room, I took my gun, a Glock 17, and I stuck it in my mouth to take my life. And I broke right there in that spot, and I turned, and I tossed the gun over my shoulder into the corner, and I said, God, if you're real... I need you now. And just like what you would expect, the lights, right? Nothing happened. The lights were still just there, just the same way. They didn't dim. You know, the ground didn't shake like it did here in Acts chapter 2 with the calming of the Holy Spirit. Nope, that didn't happen either. But you know what happened? Instantaneously in that moment, that all of that weight, all of that pressure, all of that sin that I had stacked up, if you will, by, by running from God, by fighting against God, it was gone in an instant. Instant. There was no religiosity there in, the, in that bedroom room in that night. Nothing. It, it was just a desperate man crying out to God. God, if you're real, I need you. I need you now. I need you in a special way right now. I need your unexpected grace. Well, the third thing that we see here, again, just kind of just, just, just what we're observing by reading these first handful of verses here, is that we're learning that, that, that both Peter and John... Well, what type of guys were these? Look at your Bible, verse number one. What were they doing in verse number one? Well, it was three o'clock in the afternoon, and where were they going? They were going to a prayer service, right? The, the, you know, the, in, in, in Judaism, the, Judy, the, the Jewish people, they would pray in morning, noon, and night, right? You know, they'd have those three times a day of prayer. And these guys, verse number one, tells us about Peter and John, again, as we learn about them, that they were men of prayer. And we go down a little bit farther in the verse, verses six and seven, and we see that not only were they men of prayer, but when, when, when a need was brought before them, hey, they didn't throw money at it. What they did is they invested their heart and they pointed to Jesus. So these were men of prayer and they were men of faith. And that always stirs me up. You know, no, uh, again, just, just seeing what God has done for me over the course of my life and, and how many times his unexpected grace has showed up in my life has totally encouraged me along the way. And when I see God doing that in other people's life, guess what, man? It just makes me want to jump in deeper and deeper and deeper for Jesus. They were men of prayer. They were men of faith. Um, if, if you read the rest of the chapter, you know, you get down to verses 22 to 24, right in that section there, you also find that, that Peter starts opening up the Old Testament. So we know that these guys were men of the word as well. And then one obvious takeaway, perhaps, and, 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 and we overlook this, like we go to Acts 2, and then we start moving on, and then we kind of forget some of the past there. But, but, but Acts 2 and 4 tells us that these men were filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of us need to be filled with the Holy Spirit? How many of us need to be empowered afresh by the Holy Spirit? There it is. I see you there in the back. Amen to you. <laughs> Well, two times in this chapter, again, as we're just, as we're just looking at this, we see this first side here where, 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 where Peter takes a lame man by the hand. We, we, we read a little bit farther. We come to verse number 12, and now down at verse number 12, Peter, what happens here? Well, he sees an opportunity because all the people were there together. They'd all come together, and, they, and you know, God healed this guy, and the eyes and the attention and the focus were right there. And, and all of a sudden, Peter sees this, and he goes, oh, there's an opportunity to preach right here. There's an opportunity to bring forth the word. And that's what happened in that moment. 
He stepped out in faith again. Yes, he stepped out in faith in verse number seven. And then again in verse number 12, God did a miracle. He met him the first time. And then the second time, man, he starts bringing the word in a fresh way and people are getting saved and things are happening. Listen, God's word, guess what? You have it in your Bible. God's word, it's alive and living, isn't it? It's sharper than a two-edged sword. What God has put within his word can help us and dig us out of the deepest, darkest pit. What, What God has put within his word, God is faithful to meet us right where we're at with what? unexpected grace, man. And I don't know how you are tonight. I don't know where you're at tonight, but I know this. As a 52-year-old man, married to my, my lovely bride since, well, I guess we were 20 years old at that point. We have two daughters, 34 and 24. Big gap there. Yeah, that was brave. <laughs> and we got six grandbabies from 16 to one years old. For a young fella, I have seen God intervene in my life many, many, many times. And I want to just share with you and encourage you, maybe you can take this, maybe you can take what we're seeing here just in the open side of Acts chapter 3, maybe you can make this personal. You know, are you missing out on something because fear has, has kept you from trusting Jesus? Think about that. Where is it that, that in your life that you need to take a bold step of faith for victory? Because right now, the enemy has had you beat down for three years plus. And in the new climate that we live within, with all the pressure and all the difficulty, you know, Satan has, has rocked you back on your heels. And our, and, and our focus has slipped away from a simple walk with Christ, trusting him to intervene on our behalf and to help us. And it slid back into, man, the walls are pressing in. Things are rough. Things are difficult. Things are painful. And as we make this personal, again, as we're looking into the scriptures, we're seeing, we're seeing Peter and John here in the, at, at the early church taking these steps of faith. And man, if I could do something tonight, listen, I'm not God. I'm not the Holy Spirit. I'm not Jesus. But I am a man. And I'm walking in this world just as you are. And if I could share, if I could communicate the heart of God to you and share an encouraging word, man, I would stir up your pure mind by way of reminder and say, don't forget Jesus, go after him. Keep your eyes on Christ. He's coming back again. Well, think about this. With all the the, the pressures that are there, maybe you're being crushed under that pressure. Watch, listen very closely here. Because you're feeling that crushing pressure, maybe you've started to pull back from God thinking that it's going to fix your problem. Or, 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 or what about this? Maybe, maybe you think that your, your current trial exempts you from living by faith. You know, when, when somebody speaks that and brings that out before us, I think it's like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. Um, yeah. No, I am to continue to live by faith. And can I give you a secret that you already know? So maybe it's not a secret. But what is the secret of great faith? What, what, what is the secret of these guys' faith right here? Two simple things. Again, you already know these things. Number one is believing that God is able. Able what? Able to do for you what you can't do for yourself. What else? What else? It's not, not, only, not only holding that belief that, oh, yeah, he's God. He can do everything. You know, he, he created the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a wonderful thing. But it takes it from a passive faith and moves it into an active faith. And that is what? Believing that God is willing to do for you realizing that his unexpected grace he desires, he pursues you with his love. He pursues you with his grace. He pursues you because he desires not to have your back, but to have your face. He doesn't desire for you to walk away when, when oh, all of a sudden, you know, everything fell down around me and I disappointed God. No, 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 you didn't disappoint God. Jesus saved you from the past sins, the present sins, and the future sins that you're yet to even dis- disappoint yourself on. That Christ has saved you from those things. And, and, and the secret to a simple or to a great faith is believing that God is able, yes, but believing that God is willing. Now, something else. We see Peter and John here. Again, they're coming right out of the gate. You know, birth of the church, Acts chapter 2. Now we're in Acts chapter 3, our little topical study here tonight. I don't want you to miss the example that's happening here because I think we can just, we can blow right by it. 
do, we, do you realize that Peter and John, the way that they were ministering, they were just doing exactly what they saw Jesus do. The way that Jesus did ministry, he reached out to somebody, there was a need there. He said, rise up and walk, extend that hand, whatever it was, that's what these guys were doing. So what does that mean for us? Well, we don't have to know all of, you know, we don't have to have our, 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 all of our theological ducks in a row to be able to reach out a helping hand to help somebody that's hurting. But we can do ministry like Jesus did, being willing And when Jesus spoke to, to hurting people, their lives were changed with an unexpected grace. Amen. We, we are distributors of God's grace. And I, I, I shared a little bit of my, my story about how I came to faith in that room on, on May 7th of 1993. But what I didn't tell you is the backstory. The backstory is, is that God was pursuing me for a year and a half. The backstory was, is that there were these crazy Christians at that time that kept inviting me out to this midweek barbecue. I like barbecues. It took them a while for, their, for them to get me there. But when I went to the barbecue, it really, they had some food. It was like, again, I was in Southern California, so it was more like chips and salsa. They didn't really have a barbecue. They had a Bible. And then it was a midweek home fellowship. We used to call them home fellowships back then. It was a midweek home fellowship. And for, for a year and a half, you know, me and my wife, we'd pop in and pop out. And it's like, well, okay, we're not really doing this Jesus thing and all that stuff. But listen, when the walls came crashing in and I was there that night with a gun in my mouth, I knew that the message that these Christians were sharing with me about a living God, and you guys said this earlier, right? Jesus is alive, amen? He's alive. I knew that if what they were saying was true, that he would meet me there with his unexpected grace. And whatever your situation is here tonight, I don't know. I don't know what you're going through right now in the world, but I do know this, that we are all under unusual, strange pressures. And I'll give you a biblical answer for that in just a few minutes. But I know that God is, is, is willing to meet us as long as we're open before him. Now, I want to give you um, a few examples of, of unexpected grace. So you can like kind of see this in motion, okay? And these guys will flash a few things on the screen here. Um, they're not, I, I didn't give them all the Bible verses on this because I don't want you to, to totally dive into them. I just want you, I want you to follow the flow, okay? Examples of, of unexpected grace. First way is this. First way that God, that God works is, you know, we see this in the Gospels with Jesus working with that instantaneously that he shows up, he does something. This is, this is what, what, what Peter and John were doing right here. Instantaneously, God did something amazing there. Let me give you two reference points. Luke chapter 5, verse 24. What we find here is, is that a group of, of friends, they brought a paralyzed man. They brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus sees his condition... You know, he speaks a few words for them, and there's some religious folks that are around, and he says, hey, your sins are forgiven. But then he gets down, and, 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 and he gets real practical, and he tells the guy, he says, he says, stand up. He says, pick up your mat and go home. It was very simple. Watch, hold the, hold the thought, stick with me on this. We flip to the next chapter, Luke chapter 6, verse number 10. Now we have another person would need. And this person, it says in Luke chapter six, at the beginning of the chapter, it says that they had a, a deformed hand. His right arm was deformed. So did it look like this? Did it look like this? I, I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I know it was his right arm because the text tells us that. That guy had a need and guess where he was at? He was in the church. Well, it was a synagogue. Okay. Not really a church, but you get like, okay, people of God, they were all there together. And the religious leaders in that situation, they were completely appalled because Christ would do something that wasn't prescripted. It's like, whoa, 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 we don't do that around here. What did Jesus tell him? Right in the middle of all of them, as he looked around at the crowd, as he looked at the people there, he looked at them in their eyes, and he tells the guy, he says, hold out your hand. And what do you think happened? You think the words of God fell to the ground? No, 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 no. That arm went from this right? Paralyzed. Maybe it was atrophy. Maybe the muscle wasn't there. Maybe, maybe, maybe there's no longer feeling in that. And bam, pow. If you saw the chosen, uh, if you saw that, that episode of the chosen, you remember the, 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 that little scene is played out there and the guy's arm goes, pops it, his fingers start popping. It was weird, but whatever happened, his, his, his arm was made whole. So these two men, they responded and their lives were changed. 
And even though they were in extreme situations, what's up? They did not search for an excuse. They merely stepped forward and they obeyed what God said. They were hurting. They were desperate. They were hungry for help. And I tell you, man, I, I, I'm learning this in more recent days here. I'm learning that, 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 that as the scripture says that Jesus didn't come for those who think they're righteous, righteous but for those who know they are sick. I was a sick sinner. Well, I still am a pretty messed up sinner. And, and many of you are too. But there are some that are, that, 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 that are, that are you know, creeping into the so-called church, the big picture, our community churches and all this stuff. You know, they're going through the, the religious motion and not a heartbeat for Christ because they know they're sick, but they're trying to add to their life. I'm going to clean up my, uh, clean up my life and I'm going to do it this way. I think Pastor Louie talked a little bit about that last week when he was sharing out of Galatians. But the simple power of it is, is, is God's unexpected grace coming our way. Now, I, I know that um, uh, it's been back a couple months here. I don't remember exactly how long, but I know that on this very screen right here behind me that, that we, we got a chance to see the preview of Jesus' Revolution. If you didn't see it, you need to go to the movies and check it out. It's really cool, really awesome. But there were some unexpected things that were happening at that particular time. As we're looking all the way back here to the birth of the church at the beginning of Acts, there was unexpected things that were happening at that time. Well, what about Today? If I was to say this, and I would just go like this, I would go, church, all across your church, right? Are you ready for God to do something in your life in a fresh way? Or have you put God in a box that he can only work this way, and if he doesn't work this way, well, it's not a God. As we look around, we see that God is doing something different right now. He's still saving people but he's doing something different. Maybe, maybe I could stir up your pure mind by way of reminder in Habakkuk chapter one, uh, verse number five, the Lord responding to Habakkuk, he says, look around at the nations. He says, look and be amazed for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. Listen, as I stand before you tonight and I share that God is up to new things and God is doing something that is outside the scope of maybe what we've experienced in the past 50 years. That God is doing something new. God is still on the throne. He's still active. He's still moving. He's still drawing hearts to himself. But gang, man, the word is going out to the highways and the byways and the last folks are coming in. I believe that the rapture of the church is at hand and stirring up the body of Christ with the remembering of of. of Man, this is what the church looked like at the beginning, man. People were together. People were passionate. People were excited. They didn't put God in a box. They let God get out of the box and do what he wanted to do, and they followed God. That's the message, gang, that we need within our church. We need to follow the Lord where he's leading. It doesn't take away from good Bible study. Listen, I'm a guest teacher tonight. <laughs> uh, I thank Pastor Ed and, and you guys for letting me be here for sure. But guess what? I have a little bit of liberty up here because I'm just giving you a topical message He's got the hard work, man. He's got to lead you guys into green pastures like all week long and all year long and all that stuff. Tonight, I get to just come, put a little salt, put a little pepper. Here we go. Take a look at this. This is awesome. I get to stir up your faith in a, in, in a really special way. Now, let's advance the conversation a little bit, okay? Because we're, we're talking about unexpected grace here. And um, man, it's easy for me to get long-winded and, and maybe not talk about a whole lot. But, but this unexpected grace... I just share with you a couple examples of how there's, there's instantaneously, Jesus has done some stuff. But let's do this together. Let's flip ahead, or maybe I should say flip backwards to the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 8. I want to show you something here in Mark 8. Uh, if you, you can follow along, uh, if you can get there, they may have the uh, verses on the screen as well. But in Mark chapter 8, we've got a, we've got a, a handful of verses right here. The Mark cuts right to the, right to the chase with what he's trying to share here. And he says this in verse number 22, Mark 8 and 22. He says, when they arrived at Bethsaida, that some people brought a blind man to Jesus and they begged him to touch the man and, and heal him. Pay close attention with your ears. Jesus, he took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village. And then spitting on the man's eyes, he laid his hands on him and and asked him, can you see anything now? <laughs> Jesus, you just spit it by eyes. How am I going to see something now? And the man looked around. He says, yes, he said. I see people. 
but I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. And then Jesus placed his hand on the man's eyes again, and his, his eyes were opened. His sight was completely restored, and he, he, could, he could see everything clearly. And Jesus sent him away, saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. Have you ever read that before? Show of hands so that I know that you're still with me. Show of hands. Many of you have read that. Not all of you, but many of you have read that before. And we just gloss over and we keep reading and go, yeah, that's a miracle of Jesus and everything. But have we, have we ever thought about applying this? You know, we're talking about unexpected grace right now. And so we've seen that instantaneous thing. But, but this is a picture of gradual grace. This is God doing a work. And what did he do here in verse number 23? Well, he grabbed the dude by the hand. And the first thing that he did with him is he let him out of town. God just, he said, come on, let's go. Walked him out of town. And maybe God has directed you to a change of locations tonight. But are you resisting what God is calling and leading you into for these next steps that are set right before you? You know, you know thinking about this of going, wait a minute. You know, yeah, yeah, I want my heart to be wide open to God doing something, you know, according to his will. Maybe not within my little box. Yeah, I want that unexpected grace. Well, man, here's the first thing he did with this dude. He didn't instantaneously heal him there on the spot, but what he did, again, he took him by the hand, he let him out of town. And what's the next thing they did? Well, he he spit in the guy's eyes. Well, what does that mean to us? Well, think about this for just a second. You're expecting God to work in a certain way, and maybe he was expecting just a little touch here, a little word there, or something like that, and things were all better. But he ends up getting his eyes spit in. What are you trying to say, Jeff? Well, 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 God's response to your situation, it may not be normal. It may not be something that you've already experienced. God's response to your situation might be entirely unexpected grace that you never thought he was going to do in a way you never thought he was going to do it. I like that. I think I heard somebody over here say preach. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, think about the third thing here in verse number 25 right there. You know, Jesus already placed his hands on him one time, and now he places his hands on him a second time. You know, when God walked me out from that that moment of salvation in 1993, my life was not instantaneously put back together. My sins were instantaneously forgiven. I was a new creation in Christ. Happened instantaneously. Done. But my life was not whole instantaneously. It took weeks and months and years and decades. And in fact, God's still doing things with me. I, you know, I didn't realize that you gain more problems as you get older. I thought things got better, but you know, I'm only 52. What do you expect? I'm still learning. Here's the point. That a second touch was needed on this man's life to complete the healing that God already set in motion. May you not get impatient with God. God is actively at work within your life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ here tonight, and for those of you that are listening on the radio, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know without question that God is actively at work within your life and he's going to complete that work that he started within you. He's not going to lay back. He hasn't forgot about you. And even though the times have changed and things have gotten difficult, he has not forgotten about you. His love extends that far. But there's more to do. And it's very interesting here. I love the way that this, is, this reads in the NLT. I'm reading you the NLT here tonight. But I love the way that it's put in the NLT because it, it like brings a, it like brings a um, it's like one of those things like, oh man, okay, I see that differently. That, okay, I can get that. And what it says here in verse number 26 from the NLT is, is that, that Jesus told him not to go back into the village. What does that mean to you or to to me? That God has a new path for us to walk on because he's doing new things in our life. And you know what the temptation of Satan is? Is that when, when, when it starts to get rough, is he likes to pull us back to go back into the old habits he, 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 loves for, he loves to come in and to tempt us on those old spots, those old areas where we have weakness at. And the encouragement that he tells this guy, he says, don't go back into the village, man. Well, 
that's the immediate side of, of, of God, you know, granting unexpected grace. There's a gradual side of God's unexpected grace. We went through those things here in, in, in Mark. But let's, let's speed it up just a little bit because we do got to close the message here. Let's, let, let, let's, let's, let's accelerate that a little bit. And, 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 and let's consider this. I know that uh, Pastor Bob shared this uh, on the weekend out of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He spoke extensively about it. I'm not going to. But I'm merely going to suggest to you or to encourage you with this idea and the understanding that sometimes God says that his grace is sufficient. I think if you've been around the body of Christ maybe for more than six months, you probably have heard that multiple times from a pastor, you know, not including any time that you may have read it yourself. But remember, remember that, that, that Paul's constant condition of his eye, it kept him humble. And that is something that is needed within our culture. It's something that's needed in the body of Christ. It's something that is needed amongst our pastors. May we recognize and, and, and realize that sometimes difficulties are simply to keep us humble. Simply to keep us humble. It's not that, you know, I haven't fallen out of God's grace. God hasn't given up on me. He hasn't abandoned me. But making sense of what he's doing in the moment Sometimes that could be a little bit more difficult. And, and, and man, we, we need the word of God to speak into our situations. We need other people in our lives to speak wisdom into our lives. We need that prophetic word, if you will, coming into our life. Well, let's move on to the final one of that. And that is, the other times, it's the furnace of affliction that frees us. And I think they're clicking through these things on the screen. So I'm just going to trust that. I'm not even going to look back. But in, in Daniel chapter 3, in 25, we find that, that, that here we have the, the three Hebrew teenagers, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Again, another example. That these guys were in the middle of a fiery furnace of affliction. And in the middle of that, that furnace of affliction, Christians, remember this. Folks, if you've not heard this before, if you've never come across Daniel before, you never had the opportunity to study, the, study this. Hey man, read through Daniel. It's awesome. But remember, in that furnace of affliction, what happened with them? That the fire burned away the ropes. That their movement was restored inside that furnace of affliction. They were unharmed by the flames of trouble that were there. <laughs> and I love what Nebuchadnezzar says about it. He says, okay, uh, I see somebody else that's in the fire. New King James puts it the best. It looks like the, the son of God. Yeah, 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 absolutely. In the furnace of affliction that we find ourselves in, when we get into these tough spots, we must realize that God's presence is nearer than we may expect. He's right there in the middle of it with us. We are not left alone. And church, we need to know that. We need to be stirred up in that tonight, that we are not left alone in these difficult days that we live within. Now, let's move on to the last idea uh, as we begin to make our way towards a closing here, okay? Uh, the last idea. First idea was nothing more than this, is that we were, we, were, we were looking and we were examining the big idea of the miracle, okay? And now we, now we come to the, the, the final idea here. Again, I'm just in a topical study here with you tonight. But the last idea is the message. The message. The, the message that comes out of the Word of God. The message that we have been going over. Well, who does this message apply to tonight? Maybe I could lay out one, two, three, four, five different people that this message would apply to. You know, when the, when the physical body gets under stress and remains in a situation of stress and it doesn't feel like there's any end to what that stress looks like. It doesn't feel like there's a way out. It doesn't feel like it's going to be relieved anytime soon. The illnesses begin to tick up because there's so many sicknesses that are caused from an abundance of stress. So who does this message apply to? Well, I, I, I would say this, that, that those of you that are in this room or listening on the radio or watching the live stream, that those of you with physical illness, I would encourage you this way. I'd say, take hope, my friend. Why? Why are you telling me to take hope? I've been in this condition for a while now. Because God's sustaining grace is with you, my friend. His sustaining grace. 
And for those of you that have family or friends that are, that, that, that are in a really bad, maybe even a terminal spot here with physical illness, maybe you're the distributor of that unexpected grace as you go, as you sit with them, as you talk with them, as you, as you encourage them, as you're near to them, as you're just simply doing the ministry of presence, of just being there. You don't have all the right words to say, but the Holy Spirit uses you and works in you and he works through you in powerful ways. Well, who else can this message apply to? Grab hold of your chair because this one could be a little bit rougher. Maybe you're fighting through an unwanted divorce right now. Maybe you're still wrestling and, 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 and you have a crippling addiction, whether it's drugs or something else that you know what that looks like. You've got that skeleton in your closet. You've got that, 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 that anchor that is on you. You've got that weight on your back. My friend, can I tell you this? Can I encourage you in this? That God sees. He sees that your heart is being ripped out and you're wrestling with these things. And you should know that he'll give you a preserving grace in that. Well, who else can this message apply to? Well, maybe you've been victimized and now a location change is needed so that you don't go back. Listen, God's directing grace is speaking to you. I can tell you this, that, it, that, it, that in more recent months, since the turn of this year, we're, what are we, four almost, you know, we're getting ready to be five months into this year. She whiz, where'd it go? I can tell you this, in the community that I'm from, I'm up, in, I'm up north. I'm in Westminster, Colorado. We're a bedroom community to Boulder. Some people have said that, well, that's the Republic of Boulder. It's kind of its own little thing. <laughs> that's like a community joke up there. Yeah, it is. But Westminster, it's a bedroom to that. And when people don't go in the front room, they come into the back bedroom and they end up in Westminster. All of this stuff that we're seeing come through the church doors up there right now. And just on this topic right here of have you been victimized by something? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about being a social cause. I'm talking about people really suffering through and having wrestled with some real legitimate trauma in their life. Hurt, real hurt, real pain. And man, I look and I look at the little staff that I have and I look at where, you know, where, where God has, has taken me and how he's used me and all this stuff. And I go, Lord, Lord what am I going to do with this, Lord? I don't even know what to say. And so many times God often reminds me, it's the word of your testimony. And I share with them how I came to faith. And then I open it up a little bit farther and I get real personal with them. And I share with them that from six years old all the way through those younger years of my life that I was sexually abused by a family member. And all of a sudden, the, their ears perk up and they have a different respect towards me because they're looking, they're going, okay, maybe, may, may, maybe this guy, maybe God will use this guy. There's a desperation, there's a hunger. We remember at the beginning in Acts chapter three as we were looking at, that that guy had a hunger. He'd been in that condition. You know, the scripture says, you know, the dude had been there for about 40 years or so. But there was a hunger that was there. He knew his condition. He knew the hurt. And in that, somebody stopped and said, man, I'm not just going to pat you on the back and throw a coin at you. He says in the name, Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ of the Nazarene, of, of Nazareth, he says, rise up and walk. Unexpected grace falls out. And I can't tell you that, that, that what we're seeing this year in our little church, I say little church, you know, um, it's probably not right to put a, a size or a title on a church, but we're a church of 300, if you count all the church mice and all that stuff. But they all got to show up on Sunday, and then we can count them. <laughs> okay, it, it's not that good. It, 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 it's an effective church. It's a church right there on the highways and the byways. It, 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 it's a church that's meeting and touching people. Yes, 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 and amen. But to the folks that have been victimized, guess what? God's directing grace is speaking to them. And maybe he's speaking to you tonight. That there is a way forward. That you don't have to be chained to your past. You, you don't have to let that past identify you as who you are. And I can't tell you for how long. Listen, I got saved in 1993. You know the story already. Guys, we're so close now. You know the story. But I can't tell you how many years, decade maybe 15 years that the label of all the lameness that happened in my life is still connected to what goes on on the inside. 
And it takes God sometimes to work those things out within our life. Yeah, he's, he's wonderful. He does, he does what he does for sure, yes. But the wrestling aspect that is there, sometimes it can take a lifetime to work through. Sometimes we'll never even get through it on this side. But I'll tell you, the, 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 there's a framework of hope within God and God's directing grace as he speaks to us, helps us, helps us to see that there is hope as I move forward. Well, the final one, and it's time to close here. I love this one. But maybe God has an instant healing for you tonight. Well, we, we, we kind of started the, the Bible study in this way. You know, this is nothing more than his miraculous grace in the moment. I love that. I love when, when God just takes the top off of my little situation and does something miraculous there. And I'll speak to you, you know, I don't speak to you just from leaning on a pulpit and just trying to be, you know, pastoral and just, you know, give you some stories. No, 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 no. I've only been pastoring 12 years. I was in law enforcement for about 10 years and got out of that and did a few other things along the way and started pastoring. And, and, and through that time, I've had two grandbabies that are right there against the brink of death. One accidentally, I don't know how this accidentally happens. It's a long story. I got to be careful with sharing this to you now. <laughs> but he's here today. At a year and a half years old, my grandson Joshua, a window popped open on his condo as his little head was on it, just looking out the window, and it popped open, and he fell out the window 30 feet down to the concrete. Traumatic brain injury, they came, they pronounced him dead and all this stuff. He is here today, leading and living a normal life. Yeah. Hey, Joshua, stand up. I didn't mean to call you out, brother. Stand up. This is a little guy right there. That's him. You see him. Yeah. There you go. Sorry, I'll give you a big bear hug afterwards. I didn't, mean, I, I didn't know where we were going there. It just happened. So, But God's miraculous grace, when it shows up, I think this is my second closing, so that means we really have to close, okay? Um, <laughs> you know, once again, over the last several years, our lives have, we've all seen new troubles and and. and, and new fears and new difficulties and all that. Again, the stress environment that we live in today, it's at an all-time high, without question. But in spite of this, I want you to know tonight that God is not ignoring your cry. He's preparing you for his return. Can I read you this final verse? These guys will have this on the screen here for you. First Peter chapter 4, here's what it says. I'm reading from the NLT. Peter writes, he says, dear friends, he says, don't be surprised at the fiery trials that you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. I like that. He says, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. Why? Why? so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. Look to your neighbor and say, Jesus is alive. Not bad. Not bad. You know, a guest teacher doesn't really get responses. That wasn't bad. Okay. Let me leave you with this, folks. May God's unexpected grace be upon you tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let us stand together, please. Um, as the worship team is coming forward, as you guys are closing up your Bibles and everything, um, I always love to, always love to, to make sure that there is that wonderful opportunity for the expression of faith. And so I would ask you this. Thank you for dimming the lights. As the lights are dimmed now, I would ask you this. 
that if God has been speaking to you personally tonight, will you raise up your hand so I can see you and pray for you? Raise up your hand and hold it up high in the sky here. Keep them up. I see here, I see here, I see all across this area. I see here, 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 back, all the way around, around, around. Many of you, moving over to this side. Turn your hands over like this. I'm gonna pray for you real fast. Father, all these folks in this room here, my brothers and sisters, they have come to hear from you tonight. And there's so many men and women here that are, that are looking to you for your unexpected grace. And Lord, in a very simple way, I would just pray that God, that you would meet these men and women and that you would help them right there, that you would show up, do something unexpected this week in their life. God, we know that you're real. We know that you're coming. But Lord, the trials and the stress environment that we live in day by day, Lord, sometimes it wears on us and we need a fresh hope. And so I pray, Holy Spirit, that tonight that you'd fall afresh upon us in this place. Fall afresh upon us. Lift our head. Be the lifter of our head. Grant to us fresh joy, fresh hope, fresh peace, new help. But there is none like you, and we worship you now as we go out of this place. We thank you. And we pray it all in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.